For the periodic table, we have to start with a little bit of history. So back in ancient times, there were nine elements that were known at this stage. Gold, silver, copper, iron, lead, tin, mercury, sulfur, carbon. These are the elements that the alchemists used to muck around with, trying to make gold out of lead and things like that. Okay, in the 1200s, arsenic was discovered, and in the 1300s, zinc was discovered. And in the 1600s, phosphorus was discovered. But after this, there was a massive boom, and this was Renaissance times. In the 1700s, 22 elements were discovered. In the 1800s, 50 elements were discovered. These were the times of the great scientists. Um, people like Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry, was in 1661. He was followed by Priestley and Lavoisier and Davy and Dalton and all those guys that we've spoken about. In the 1900s, 29 elements were discovered, and this is partly because of all the technology that we've got now. We were also able to synthesize our first elements, and that was 98 and above on the periodic table. And in the 2000s, five more elements have been synthesized, and I haven't actually updated that, so that could even be more um, by this time. Depends on when you're watching this. A couple of guys we have to have a look at because they've made major contributions to the periodic table. So let's start with Antoine Lavoisier. Um, Antoine was the first person to put the elements into groups. So okay, this is some arrangement, putting these elements into groups. Johann Dobrienne, okay, I can't pronounce that, but Johann arranged elements into groups of three called triads, and it looks something like this. Basilius, he was the first guy to decide to use letters as symbols, and they came from old words, sometimes Latin words, so for instance, iron was ferium, and he called it Fe, sodium was natrium, and Na and so on, and we still use a lot of those today. John Newlands, he arranged the elements into a table with eight columns, and he believed or found that elements exhibited similar behaviour when they were put into these sort of comment, uh, columns, so they had similar chemical properties. Lothar Mayer, what Lothar did was he plotted atomic volume versus atomic mass and what he found was a series of peaks were produced. This proved that each wave of these peaks corresponded to some sort of period and it showed that Newland's law of octaves was actually worked for the second and the third period but after this the periods had to be longer because there were more elements involved. But he noticed the periodic variation. And by periodic, we're talking about that on a regular basis, there were obvious trends. Enter Dmitri Mendeleev, who is often thought of being the creator or the father of the periodic table. But as we've seen, a lot of people came before him and contributed to that. Mendeleev arranged the elements both by increasing atomic mass and also with similar chemical properties into groups. So by groups we're talking about downwards and across ways he did atomic number. He noticed that there was a gradual change in chemical properties when you went across each row on the periodic table. And one of the important things he did was he left gaps for elements that were yet to be discovered. So if the element that was next in atomic mass didn't have the same chemical property as that group, he assumed or predicted that some other element had yet to be discovered. What he also did, he listed separately some odd elements that just didn't seem to fit in with any properties of the main groups, such as iron, cobalt, nickel and copper, and he put them just on the side. His periodic laws stated that the properties of the elements are a periodic function of their atomic mass. In other words, properties change on a regular basis with the weight of the atom. Mendeleev predicted that 
some of the accepted values of atomic masses were wrong and he also predicted some of the properties of the undiscovered elements based on the structure of his periodic table. Mendeleev's table is the basis of the periodic table that we still use today. A couple more guys I need to talk about. John Rayleigh, he discovered argon and William Ramsey discovered helium, neon, krypton and xenon. And we now know these as the noble gases because these were unreactive. These were some of the last elements to get discovered. Some of the names for the noble gases come from words. For instance, helium comes from helios, meaning sun, neon, neos, meaning new, krypton, hidden, and xenon, stranger, and argon, of course, meaning inactive. Henry Moseley, he arranged the atoms in the order of the increasing positive charge. And we now know that this positive charge was the number of protons. Glenn Seaborg, he was the discoverer of, or with other people as well, of the 10 transuranium elements. And this included plutonium, and he was one of the members of the team of the Manhattan Project that um, created the first or developed the first atomic bomb. He actually wrote a letter to Truman asking them to demonstrate the first bomb to the Japanese rather than using it. Unfortunately, as we're all now aware, Truman didn't listen. He also synthesized um, the very first ever new element, which was 106. Um, Seaborg went on to do a lot of really good work with nuclear medicine. So this is just a bit of a timetable here of all of these guys. You don't need to memorize these. You do need to know that um, Mendeleev was, was pretty much the, responsible for the modern periodic tables, we know it. But all of these people help us do chemistry today, so it's important that they get a mention and acknowledgement. So how is the modern periodic table organised? Okay, so we now order them by increasing atomic number, which we know is the number of protons. We divide the periodic table into the group of metals, non-metals, which are on your right hand side, and of course the metalloids here, which is this group that stands out. Okay. Groups. Groups are the vertical columns. So we have group 1, group 2, group 3, group 4, group 5, group 6, group 7, and so on. They can also be numbered in the older fashioned way, which is using Roman numerals. So we've got group 1, group 2. We skip the transition metals, and we have group 3, group 4, group 5, group 6, group 7, and group 8. I find these are still much easier to work with. they indicate the number of electrons in the outer shell. And that's why these ones are much easier to work with because group one has one in the outside shell, group two has two in the outside shell, and group three has three in the outside shell. Okay, they have certain names, these groups, that are recognized around the world. Group one are known as the alkali metals. Group two are the alkali earth metals. Group 7 are known as the halogens, and group 8 are the noble gases. The periods are the rows, the horizontal rows which go across the periodic table, and these are numbered 1 through to 7. And they indicate the number of occupied electron shells. So, period 4, for instance, has 4 electron shells that are occupied by electrons. These here are called the transition metals. The period down here are called the lanthanides and these ones here are called the actinides. What was found in the periodic table now is that repeating patterns of electronic configuration. Also that the outer shell electrons were the most important in determining the chemical properties of an element. So, of course, the periodic reoccurrence of similar properties must be related to the electron configuration. So we can use it to predict the electron configuration from the position of the element 
on the periodic table. And this we've seen when we were talking about electron configuration. If we break up the periodic table, we can break it up into the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. And if you're not quite sure of any of this, please go back and have a look at the electron configuration video. Okay, let's have a look at strontium as an example. Here is strontium. And from strontium, we can predict. We know that it is in group two and it is in period five. So from that now, we know that the electron configuration must end with a five, S2. S2 being the orbital that's being filled, indicated by the fact that it's in the S block and it's the second row of the S block. So it's S2 and it's in the fifth period. So it is the fifth electron shell which is being filled up. Okay, so group 1 alkali metals all have one electron in an S orbital. So group 1 alkali here. Lithium has two S1. Sodium, three it's in period three and it's S1 shells getting filled up. Potassium is 4S1, period four, still S1. Rubidium is 5S1, cesium is 6S1 and francium is 7S1. The group two alkali earth metals. They have a complete S subshell, which has a maximum or it has a two electrons in it. Beryllium. It is in the second period. The second or the S subshell has two electrons in it. So it is 2S2. Magnesium is in the third period. It is, has a 3S2 subshell is being filled. The P block here has six groups. One, two, three, four, five, six. Each P subshell can hold up to six electrons. So let's have a look at aluminium. Aluminium must be filling up its P subshell and it has one electron in it because it is in the P1. Argon is in P6. It is in the third period. So it is filling up the three P6 subshell. The transition metals are the transition metals here and they have 10 groups in them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The reason being each D subshell can hold up to 10 electrons and this is the D block. Scandium for instance here will be filling up 3D1. Notice it is not four, even though it's in the fourth period, because the 3D subshell fills up after the 4S2. So these two are already filled. Let's have a look at zinc. Zinc is 3D10, because it is in the D block, and it is the 10th one in the D block. Remember, 4S there has been filled. Okay, and you've got the lanthanides and the actinides, and these are the F subshells being filled. 14 row of 14 columns, they can fit 14 electrons. And that's how the periodic table is currently organised. P being hold, able to hold 6, D being able to hold 10, and F being able to hold 14. Okay, so always remember that the number of outer shells equals the number of the period or the horizontal row. So now you can do some chapter questions for me. Um, you'll get a chance in class to complete those.